Well, just one other little thing I think we mentioned while we were both here together was the Milton Torres case, which I know is not a little thing at all, yeah. but uh, you, one thing you made me aware of uh, in your talk last night is that that was actually first reported in 1991, I think it was, wasn't it? in the Daily Star, they yes, did a feature yeah. on Milton Torres, because yes. the first time I'd heard about that case uh, was I think in around about 2008, 2009, when he, he was, I think you'd done a couple of lectures, haven't you? He'd done a couple of radio interviews about his case. And this was this extraordinary case where he was flying um, over Suffolk, was it? it or no, yes, from across it, which off the coast of it, with Ipswich and Suffolk, yeah. Onto and the North Sea, yeah, to when uh, yeah, he was ordered to fire his rockets at this thing. And his Super Saber F 86D. Yeah. Scrambled from Manson with his wingman because they were on QRA standby. And uh, within seconds of him, he had this coded order given him which shook him up. <laughs> and he challenged it, couldn't believe what he was being told. And he said, uh, must have come from the Royal Air Force because we weren't allowed to uh, fire any weapons in your airspace. Yeah. Or even on the ground. The Rendlesham Forest case, Colonel Holt and his team who wintered the forest more than once, they had to leave all their hand weapons and their right. rifles in the truck inside the base. They couldn't yeah. take them out into the forest, you know, yeah, in our territory yeah, yeah. without permission from the UK government. So Yeah, so Torres was uh, 1957, wasn't it? That 57, was, yes. He, this happened he, he was 26 years old yeah, then. Years old. And then, yeah. so he, t he, he, told this he told this to the Star newspaper yeah. in 91. That surprises me because he was told so forcibly by uh, 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 the superiors. No, the, uh, no, he calls them the spook. The American spook came from London, uh, and he, he's pretty sure that he was an NSA okay. official. And he, he briefed both pilots separately uh, and warned them this was highly classified, and he was not even to talk to his uh, squadron commander about it. So why he, he ended up giving an interview to the Daily Star in 1991, he, he, he came over to the UK several years on the trot, might have been perhaps two or three years in between, because at Manston, where they were based, they had squadron unions, uh, and they had perhaps another F-86 still sat around at Odon. So I think it was one of his reunion visits yes. when he, he decided to do an interview why the Daily Star, how he got hold of the Daily Star, I don't know. But again, at one of his uh, reunions, there was an ex RAF sergeant who was heavily into historical aircraft, particularly the Super Sabre. He has a website called uh, Duncan Sabres, and anyway, it's Duncan Curtis's name. Yep. And he, he actually told him, because he was obviously questioning an ex pilot about his aircraft information for his website I suppose and Milton decided I suppose to perhaps advisedly defy his uh, order of uh, secrecy to mention it to him uh, I think that was all and then in 19 how I came to know of it was through Harry Harris a solicitor friend in Manchester who was a, a very active ufologist at the time and Harry was in London on a course to refresh certain solicitor rules on conveyancing, which was what his particular speciality was, and he left his hotel, or wherever he was, to go for a, to a steakhouse for a meal, and he was queuing, it was one of these self-service things, like carvery I suppose, and he was behind two American ladies, and they um, said, oh, making conversation here, having a tourist site around London, and they said, well we are, but our husbands are here because they're ex-pilots and we've been to Manston for a squadron reunion, you see. So Harry says, um, oh, so he's a pilot. Has, has he ever seen a UFO? <laughs> Which is what you should always ask pilots. Yeah, yeah. And uh, his wife said to him, oh, not only has he seen one, he was ordered to shoot one down. Because Harry was very excited about that. He dropped his tray. And then anyway, he sat down, and he, he, like he was in the toilet at the time and had a meal with them, mm -hmm. and they became quite good friends, and uh, on previous, uh, subsequent uh, reunion, they came up and stayed with Harry and Sue Harris in Manchester, en route to go to the Lake District in Scotland, you know, to see the sites. 
and his wingman pilot, Dave Robeson, also joined them. Uh, and this date, which was 20th of May 1957. Uh, and they both agreed with, with the narrative that they yes. were given the, the same coded order yep. to, to fire off their 24 mighty bounce missiles at this crowd. Yeah. And then the thing got shot off. No, knowing, I think, that the weapons were locked onto them, which yes. happens a lot. Yes, kind of, yeah. and, it, and it was, he was flat out at almost Mach 1, 9.92, nine wasn't it? Yeah. He, he could fly, and uh, this thing pulled away from him, off, off his scope, it was locked on to fire, and he, Milton reckoned it was doing uh, a Mach 10, at least. Yeah. Yeah. And the radar, ground radar at uh, Board 6 in Suffolk Coast, which was his GCI centre, said um, the object went off their radar scope in two turns of the, the scanner. Uh, so report back to base, you know, go back to yeah, yeah. They call it home plate, go back to Banster, and you will be debriefed. And this chap came up from London the following day and read the riot act to them and recorded yeah. what they had yeah. to say. So, in, anyway, 1990. Five, it might have been four, when I sat in Harry's office in, in, in Sale and Milton was on the phone and he recorded Milton's phone conversation, his experience, and he, he backed it up with a paper print off of his experience. So I got permission from Harry to delve deeper into the case, try and find out who gave the orders yes. to fire, which yeah. is a big burning question. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, I uh, had some telephone conversations with Milton and some emails. He wasn't very good at emailing. But anyway, he sent me some very nice pictures, which I used in the talk. And I also spoke to Dave Robeson, his wingman, and uh, tracked down from where the route from the order would come. Okay. Going back to Fighter Command at um, Bentley Priory at Stanmore which was the old RAF Fighter Command headquarters and they had a bunker there, you know, so I reckon that for such a serious thing it, it would have been a much senior rank to give the orders to fire and I suspect it would be a grouped captain as a minimum, possibly an air commander or even a vice mar air marshal to uh, give it the license to expend all the ordnance on one hand and also the risks Cold War time. Yeah. <coughs> so if it was an incident, you know, it could become very politically embarrassing. So it's, there's all these risks that somebody would have to weigh up before giving the order to fire. And it could have been ended up at the loss of the aircraft and <coughs> the deaths of the two pilots. As has happened in the Americans, a lot of pilots being killed attacking UFOs. Yeah. Until President at the time. Uh, Eisenhower, I think. I don't know, I, don't know, Eisenhower. I think we sent this order not to fire, to try and get them to land. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is a bit ridiculous. And then later you said that the wingman, uh, what's his name again, David? David Robert Robertson. Robert Robert Robertson. Robert. See, he, he, he was quite elderly, quite elderly uh, both quite elderly. Yeah. And Milton Twins passed on now, hasn't he? And he passed on a couple of years ago, didn't he? I don't know. I believe he did, yeah. I'm I, I, surprised. I, I, I was believe he passed on. Oh, right. um, but the Dave Robertson, uh, he, he, you know, you'd, you'd heard more recently that uh, he'd gone into a retirement home, hadn't he, or a residential yeah. care home. Yes. So tell yeah. us about what happened with that. Yeah. Well, uh, he sort of denied on that day he'd, he'd flown a mission with Milton uh, and ever given an order to attack a UFO. So he, he completely changed his story for when they were sat together at Harry Harris's home in Sale uh, some years previously. Yeah. And I think maybe he was worried or he'd been warned, possibly because of the publicity now of the case, um, because he was in a home funded by Uncle Sam yeah. and on a pension yeah. from Uncle Sam, and maybe he felt at risk or then threatened him about that. So he, he went into sort of denial, which is a shame. In fact, I think he wrote a letter to Harry, which ended up with all Harry's letters to the MOD, uh, to Air Staff 2A, with Dick Pope, was there. I think it was Dick Post, I don't know, it might have been a bit later. 
And uh, when they released these documents in the 1980s, the only reason it was in the 1980s, like in the incident took place in the 1950s, uh, they, um, of Harry Harris's correspondence, badgering the MOD, and I've got copies of those quite humorous, some of the side comments from people. It's that Harris again, you know, sort of niggling and chiseling away at trying to get information. They passed into an American records place in the States because they said, oh, it's an American unit, we haven't got the records of their operations mm. at Manston, etc. So it was passing the book very neatly. So Harry, beautifully being Harry, writes off and he gets a reply back from some USAF major, I think, denying all knowledge. And uh, I filed a Freedom of Information Act request on the MOD, which didn't go very far. I did get a very nice response from a chap, actually. Uh, the Air Historical Branch 2, as it was called, let's perhaps still call that, which was also based at um, Bentley Priory right. somewhere at that time, I don't think it is now. And uh, he told me that all the records for the 1950s had long been destroyed. So, the, and even if they hadn't been, there was no way they were going to tell me the name of the officer who had given Milton Torres the orders to fire, I suppose. It'd be very naive mm, mm, of me mm, to think mm, that, that they would mm, do that. Mm, mm. But it was worth a go. Yeah, yeah. Because so. then you, because then you had this uh, document, uh, um, which was this report b uh, about the sh shoot down of the UFO, but uh, the name was all the names were blanked out. Whether that's uh, that come through Harry had it, had he got it through a Freedom of Information request or declassified document? No, no he, he must have sent that letter to the MOD with his, his letters of request. Yeah, here's a pilot letter which was turned out to be Dave Roberson. Well, all yeah. the names was blacked out. So when he when I look at the documents, everyone assumes that it was Milton's. It was Milton Torres yeah. who written that, but it wasn't. And it wasn't. It was Dave Robeson. Yeah. So yeah. And he was defending or protecting his position, denying it on the twentieth of May. He hadn't flown as wingman to uh, to Milton on this mission to uh, shoot down the UFO. And the the other th extraordinary thing that uh, you told us about this case was this when you made the inquiries that one of the people that you spoke to referred to you to this book they oh, yeah. said we didn't have a document so tell us about what they referred you to yeah. and the well. the author of that book who we yeah. know well don't we unfortunately yes well there's a certain gentleman who's a yorkshire hallam university chappie mm. from the past uh, called dr david clark and he got himself in his position or was put in his position to manage all the UFO releases from the MOD at the Public Records Office in Kew, PRO, and write informative in information, adding to the, the, the mere document reference as a sort of guidance. In fact, he wrote quite a long spiel, which is on the web internet, of how to guide people through all these releases, which they did by um, decade to decade, um, now, when I got a reply from this gentleman at the Air Historical Branch, the best he could offer me under the Freedom of Information Act request was that there was a, a brief reference in a book by David Clark and Andy Roberts, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he even said it's page 406. A now, page reference. Yeah, yeah. I, and I thought that's a bit rich. This has come from a so-called ufologist, but debunker, uh, yes. no doubt about it, Clark isn't. So Clark knew about that case yes. all that time ago, and the book was published in 2002, well, got the information yes. from five the years before I was doing all this investigation. RAF sergeant called Duncan Curtis, for, for off his website. Yes. I think. So, so to Andy earlier, Roberts, yeah. or Dr. Clark, had lifted it out of Curtis's book, it's this horse historical book about the use of uh, operations of Sabre F-86Ds and that was just something he threw in the book. So they lifted a bit of that and put a chapter in mentioning the Torres case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so uh, I thought that was a bit ironic in a way 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it's, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. You know, this is how the information is managed, and uh, I've, I've come across David Clark. I mentioned my experience with the brief experience with David Clark. Mm. I was invited to speak on Radio Derby. I think they had World UFO Day or something mm. one year. This was about mm. seven, eight, nine years ago. Mm. You know, and I live just outside Derby, and they got my name down as a person of, you know, who knows about these things. And then I got into the uh, the studio. It was only like a ten minute talk or something, five minute talk in the m breakfast show about seven, seven o'clock in the morning, half seven in the morning. And they, they, who was on the phone line, who I didn't know, David Clark. And he's not even from Derbyshire, he's mm. lives in Yorkshire somewhere. Yeah. So I'm thinking, why have they got this David Clark on to speak when they've invited me as a local person to uh, to speak on the show as well? All very strange. Uh, and it, I think it's, it's part of the way that this information is managed. Yeah. But uh, I'd like to thank you very much, David, for, for spending time with me to go through those details okay. again that you Pleasure. went through last Pleasure. night. And I'll, I'll make this into a video. We'll talk to Robert, obviously, and, yeah. Um, yeah. and we'll maybe get this posted in the next week or two, Pleasure. just so that people get a bit more information about these uh, very important cases that yeah. you've, uh, yeah. you know, you've kept alive, so to speak, or helped yeah. keep alive. Yeah. And uh, again, thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Right, thank you.